Alright, so uh, what's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on Thursday, June 18th, with uh, Nicholas Gregory and Tom Trevathan from Commerce Block. So uh, welcome back, guys. It's nice to have you again. Hey. You can be here. So um, I figured I'd start off the uh, the show with kind of a... An attempt at triggering as much of a a component piece of this space as possible. Um, so I just watched the London uh, the Bitcoin Devs Socratic seminar on Schnorr's um, and Taproot's BIP uh, yesterday, and I'm not gonna lie. Um, I'm starting to wonder if just general reticence and anxiety about fundamental crypto changes. Um, might actually make this a very contentious thing if the deployment schedule uh, lines up with a massive uh, bull market and we just get a lot more clueless, unaware people in this space. Yeah. So um, is this regards to you know, future upgrades, et cetera? Um, just in general, but I'm, I'm kind of – wondering if Schnorr might fall victim to that now because it's it's just this you know attitude since segwit that we we got it in we we won the war against bitmain so to say so that just means everything that we want to fork into bitcoin isn't going to be contentious going forward but you have to consider that when you bring new players into this space who put their money into this um they're not necessarily just going to blindly follow what all the nerds want to do. Well, I think a good thing in life in general is to always be in the moment. And you just can't assume that Bitcoin will ever change. I mean, SegWit was originally non, non-contentious. It was a malleability fix. And I, at the time, was work, involved with things that really didn't go too well because of the delay of SegWit. So I think from our point of view, we just have to assume nothing's going to change. And anything that does change is a bonus. And, you know, I, I, if we do hit a bull run, we're certainly going to have more eyes, more external parties looking at the protocol. And that I do think will make any changes much more harder to push through. I mean, I think in general, I mean, it's a good thing that, well, one, Bitcoin's big, you know, selling point is its its reliability. It's kind of, uh, and I think as it, it, as, as it becomes more valuable, I think it becomes more difficult to change. Um uh, you know, people will rightly be very conservative about ch- any changes to Bitcoin. Um, and so even if think things do happen, I think we can assume that they're going to happen very, very slowly, um, which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, I think you have to kind of you have to assume, I think, when you're uh, building a business on Bitcoin that, you know, you have to work with what you got, essentially. Yeah. And it's, you know. It's particularly what what kind of has me thinking skeptically now is the the nature of Schnorr. Like it's not just a uh, an opcode change or a tweak to structure um, in terms of data. It's an actual fundamental change to the cryptography. And you know, I've I've even had my own kind of wait a second moment. Um, when they first dropped the original um, Schnorr and Taproot BIP um, and they made the design decision to just have the public key directly exposed. And, you know, even like I was kind of like, whoa, like isn't the entire Hmm. design rationale um, hashing the addresses, not just for the space efficiency in chain, but that protection um, from any kind of quantum threat uh, as far as reused addresses. And, you know, that that design decision in my mind was like, wait a second. But then you walk through the logic of, well, 40% of addresses currently holding balances or UTXOs attached to them um, are reused. And then on top of that, most light wallets just send off master pub keys to a backend server. So you compromise those and how many coins are... And so it's like kind of like, well... My previous assumption was just security theater, essentially. But 
you know, I at first was like, wait a second. And so like, if we really do go on this massive bull run and draw a bunch more liquidity and new users and participants into this space, like what is their attitude going to be about fundamental cryptographic changes like that? Yeah. 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 It's uh, another, another issue I think with, with, with Schnorr is even if we, we have the ability to use Schnorr, um, you also, when you're thinking about any kind of privacy feature that uh, you don't just need the ability to use Schnorr, you actually need Schnorr to have kind of wide scale adoption as well, because you need the anonymity set. Um, this was uh, uh, like, I was reading the like coin swap uh, mm-hmm. by, by Chris uh, Belker uh, the other day. And yeah, he made a good point that, that really for a kind of privacy um, use case, you, you, you really want to use uh, the, the existing ECDSA um, because the anonymity set is so large. Um, so even when they turn on Schnorr, you may actually have to wait quite a long time before you have a large enough anonymity set for it to actually be, you know, private to, to use Schnorr like properly. Yep. And I mean, it's, it's really like, you know, I would love to have Schnorr. It's, it's an amazing jump forward and especially the types of improvements you can make to things like multi-sig or different second layer protocols, I think get a lot cleaner, but you know, is everybody going to share that attitude when it finally gets time to actually roll out a deployment? Like I'm, I'm sure you guys remember the anonymous, um, complaints or kind of skepticism after the initial review period ended. Um, and I, I have my thoughts to who that is. Um, but you know, there, there was immediately after that period, a bunch of fundamental attacks on the design and, you know, where did that come from? You know, how, how much contention over this is there out there? That's just kind of being quiet right now. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to say until yeah we see we see it become political. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then you know one, one more thing I kind of want to throw out in left field uh, before we kind of move along to what you guys are doing over there. But um, have you seen the uh, um, ECDSA um, threshold scheme from uh, Ran Canetti, um, Nicholas Mac- or Macrianis, and Udi Pallet? Okay, is this is this quite recent? Um, yeah, it was actually, I think, um, the beginning of May. Um, I actually still haven't even read this um, myself. <laughs> I haven't as a time. I, I was <laughs> just blindsiding you guys and thinking maybe you did. But um, it's a, an ECDSA threshold um, scheme that's four rounds. And three of those rounds can be done in pre-computation, so it's effectively Ooh, yeah. a non-interactive protocol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did, I did, uh, I did see this. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's yeah, it's, it's kind of very interesting. I don't think it was actually cheaper in terms of overall like computation uh, than than some of the existing protocols, but it did. I think it did hold the the promise of like being able to work obviously the fact that it's non-interactive means that you can make it work with kind of cold storage um which is one of the big problems with multi-party ecdsa is that you can't really use it with cold storage because it means you'd have to be swapping like you know <laughs> swapping uh, usb sticks uh like four or five times between uh between machines um so yeah that that, that could be a, a really a really big uh advantage well, I just find it kind of like interesting and ironic that, um, you know, right when Schnorr is well, pretty much getting finalized and the conversation is probably going to soon move to deployment, um, here's an ECDSA protocol with that, uh, that non-interactive benefit that can do a lot of the stuff um, that we're forking Schnorr in for. Yeah. And obviously things as, as the understanding increases and, you know, there'll probably be future improvements. And uh, um, although, you know, I still think any, anybody who can, you know, knows, understands the differences between ECDSA and Schnorr kind of can just see the the real appeal of Schnorr in its kind of elegance and simplicity. 
um, I think a lot of people have that one of their big objections to kind of multi-party CDSA is just that they're, they're all, all the algorithms are kind of quite complex and rely on additional cryptographic assumptions, which can all be avoided just by using Schnorr. And Schnorr obviously just everything's linear. It's just so kind of simple and uh, to, to do, to do any kind of a MPC with it. Um, and so like, yeah, I definitely, definitely still see the appeal of Schnorr. But, you know, as, as time goes on, it seems like we're able to do more and more of the things, um, that, uh, you know, Schnorr's being pushed for, uh, just directly with East DSA. It's just, it's just kind of interesting because, you know, I've, especially since, uh, you guys dropped the, the Mercury, uh, specification, like I've just been stuck with half of my time in this what if rabbit hole of like, what what if Bitcoin doesn't actually change from this point on? Like, what is that going to look like? Like, I, I don't think really anybody for the most part in this space is really thinking about that. Like, what could we do in, in the grand scheme of things if everything just froze today? Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really what you've got to, to plan for. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I don't think it would be like I said before, I think this, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot to be said for, for that kind of modification, um, in terms of, you know, Bitcoin becoming what people want it to become, which is this, this source of, uh, um, you know, you can rely on it um, and it doesn't change. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I can definitely see this may be happening and also that this may be not be a bad thing. Um, but then, yeah, you just have to work around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point to uh, kind of drive into the the whole Mercury topic. Um, you know, this this was really fucking awesome um like this actually kind of blew my mind when you guys first dropped this um because i've been following uh ruben and his thinking on state chain since he first dropped the the original um proposal at scaling bitcoin and i mean like that just immediately was like amazing like you've now taken transacting off chain to passing the actual payments channel construct itself around off chain but it, it required at least um, sig hash, uh, no previous input. And you guys have, have created a variant that could be deployed right now today. Yeah, I mean, it didn't, we didn't think of it. That wasn't my intention, to be honest. We were, we were spending a lot of time looking at discrete log contracts because we, we had some interest to kind of build these on top of the side chains we deployed to, you know, to kind of create some interesting uh, derivative types on top of a, a side chain. And I guess one of the issues with using discrete log contracts, you do have a lot of potentially capital locked up. So it's very capital inefficient because you need to have capital locked up for all the outcomes. So discrete, um, you know, state chains give a way to novate that lockup. Obviously, because if you're locked up, if you have funds locked up on a private key, you can now novate it. And that's where we started looking at the state chain concept because it was one of the, the better approaches. And then I, I guess after we posted some messages on the, on the, on the, on the, the dev mailing list, then it became more of a project on its own. But that's how it kind of really started. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's like just really interesting the way you guys constructed things without um, requiring L2. You know, I mean, if, if you kind of want to break down for the, the listeners just a, a TLDR for it, like I, I think it's a, a really interesting um, trade-off given the, the lack of that feature on the main chain. So, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we... I think we, we decided that we wanted to push ahead with this. And obviously you've got to think, okay, you've got to make it work. Um, uh, be able to, to have control over when you can launch this. Um, so um, the issue, what the, the, the issue with uh, basically that L2 solved in this was a way to um, enable uh, the, we call them backup transactions. Um, that when you change the ownership of a UTXO via the the, the state chain mechanism, the current owner gets a a transaction which they can use to 
uh, recover the funds if the state chain entity, which is the co-signer, um, disappears. Um, and so in the original design from Ruben, um, this used uh, this uh, L2 um, mechanism from uh, Christian Decker, um, where uh, essentially you, you require this uh, you know, Sikash no input, uh, Sikash type, which would require, which isn't yeah, in Bitcoin yet, and it, it probably wouldn't be there for a while after, even if uh, Schnorr gets activated. Um, uh, so, uh, but this 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 allows you basically to create a new backup transaction which supersedes the previous backup transaction uh, using the the L2 uh, mechanism. Um, but because we can't rely on that, we 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 had to think of uh, an alternative. Um, and the the protocol we ended up going for, which was also first described, I think, in this. 2015 paper again by Christian Decker, uh, where they introduced the concept of um, uh, like um, uh, what's it called uh, the um, yeah, but the, yeah, they, they, in this 2015 paper um, yeah, and uh, sorry, is that the scriptless stuff? No, 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 no. Oh, what's this? Oh, the, you mean the, the decrementing time lock from one of his old uh, Spillman channel concepts? Yeah, yeah, but there was, there was another paper where they elaborated on this. Um, so first of all, there's, there's you know, we, we re- actually we originally thought about using just decrementing kind of end lock time, um, so that you had a, a a backup transaction that the first backup transaction would be um, basically could be broadcast sometime in the future. Um, say like you know six months from now, and then when you updated the the UTXO ownership, um, you'd the new backup transaction would have an end lock time which is slightly lo- less in time. So this could be broadcast first, and so that the current owner has the transaction with the, the soonest um, end lock time. Uh, but this is not very good because as you change ownership, you you decrease the amount of time left for that ownership before it has to go on chain. Um, and so you have a finite lifetime of the UTXO ownership. And also, you know, as the more you use it, the, that time decreases. And so you've got these kind of moving, you've got the real time and your current end lock time, and they're kind of approaching each other every time you, you do a transfer of ownership. Um, but this other method uh, using um, uh, like what's what's called a, like a kickoff transaction, and then a relative time lock. Essentially, that you ha- you still have this decrementing time lock, but it's using bit sixty eight um, and the the end sequence number. Um, and you can uh, essentially um, uh, use this and have a, an open ended kind of <clears throat> uh, channel or uh, state chain for for a UTXO. So you don't actually have to, you don't have to close it until the kickoff transaction is broadcast. Uh, the clock doesn't start ticking. Um, so you still have a finite um, kind of a uh, number of times that this UTXO can be transferred off chain before you have to uh, broadcast the, the backup transaction and, 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 you know, can close it on chain. Um, but, this can be open ended. There's no time limit, um, but the yeah the issue with with the, with the L2 the number of times you could transfer this is is essentially unlimited. Well, it's not it's not unlimited, but it, you know it's billions and billions of times. Um, whereas with this kind of decrementing relative lock time uh, mechanism, you you know you have you probably have to make it safe that each each decrementing time gives enough time for the current owner to, to have their transaction confirmed. Um, you know, you may be able to have like do a thousand transfers with a, with a kind of reasonable, um, you know, kind of maximum, uh, time that someone would have to wait to get their funds back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that actually, you know, that, that limitation or trade off doesn't really lend itself as well for, just general purpose transfers 
But I think that actually kind of fits very well in the niche of, you know, DLCs built on top in terms of financial contracts, you know, which it's, it's, it wouldn't be exactly the same because they generally have hard line expiries or, or redemption dates, but you know, that, that type of world people are used to, like, there is some kind of settlement time here. Like I can't just press a button and voila, I have my money. Yeah. 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 Um, Expiry coupon in a derivative. That's the way to think of it. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, it's like, what, you know, what kind of, um, you know, uses can you really put that to in terms of the finance world? Because, you know, that, that's not a side of the space that a, a lot of the, the Twitter personalities and such really think about too much. But that's a ridiculously useful thing because... Yes. I'd say the two, uh, I mean, we're, we're only driven by the clients that have reached out to us, but uh, I guess in the derivatives world, again, a way of doing a, a non-counterparty risk derivative, it's quite appealing. And by having this kind of um, state chain construct, you can move out of that position or sell it as long as you're willing to find, as long as you're able to find a willing buyer of that position. And then, you know, we've had a few people that have uh, kind of looked at building clearing systems and obviously clearing on state chains it's kind of instant as opposed to you know on-chain settlement times or even a side chain settlement this kind of gives you instant clearing so those are the kind of two verticals we've spoken to on 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 the on the b2b side and obviously i think we would like we're we're hoping to make a, a retail product from this which would be standalone and i think people would look at seeing that as something that complements lightning or potentially adds more privacy to their bitcoin transactions yeah definitely that um I'd like to get into it a, a little bit, but, you know, I, I, I want to kind of stick with the, the financial side of things for a second, because, you know, th- this is something I think that will honestly, um, at least in terms of what comes first, be a bigger driver for the adoption of Bitcoin than anything retail related. And it, it, re- it really comes down to like just the nature of derivatives contracts, you know, futures, things like this. You know, a, a lot of financially illiterate people have this this notion that derivatives, futures contracts, it, it's just degenerate gambling and nothing else. And why does the world need that? But, you know, you forget like one, one of the biggest uses of futures in the world is, is for things like farmers who have a, an extreme, you know, environmental volatility to their income. And it is the liquidity brought into the market through futures that allow them to deal with that volatility and survive as useful businesses that I don't think anybody on the world or can argue is not necessary for society. And it's, it's an incredibly necessary and useful thing. It's not the derivatives that are the problem. It's the money that they're based in just being funny money that can be printed into infinity. So these types of products coming to Bitcoin, I think are it it will fix them because it puts them on a sound money where they can still provide the utility that they do to the market. Well, interestingly, the first you know the first people we were speaking to this, they'd already been doing building hash rate futures. But they wanted a way of implementing and, and removing the kind of custody, custodial risk. And that's where we were looking at this because, you know, miners obviously want to kind of lock their position in and be, uh, protect them from any future uncertainty. So that's, that's the kind of customers we were spoken, spoken, speaking to originally on this. Yeah, exactly. It's not degenerate gamblers. It's people no. running actual businesses that need some way to mitigate the volatility of the market they're in. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a, a very, yeah, very, very, very important kind of powerful use case there. Mm-hmm. But you know, you know, what what are you guys' thoughts though on on applying it to the other side of things? You know, I I can definitely see um, in my mind some synergies between Lightning, but I'd like I'd like to hear what you guys are kind of thinking in that direction. Well, we are we are. Mercury is going to be a standalone service. I think we've been quite open about that. We're going to hopefully, we're looking at maybe having a proof of concept, soft launch around August, September timeframe with its own wallet. So we do want to test it out in the wild for that. 
And, you know, I think there's some interesting use cases around privacy. To be honest, my thoughts around Lightning is a lot from what you've said. It wasn't something we were originally thinking about, but it's been a lot of the commentary you've come that's come from yourself. But I think our initial use case will be a way to move, you know, Bitcoin around in a non-custodial manner, in a private manner. And, you know, we've looked at things like coin swaps as well, that maybe we could implement that as a complementary service to, to state chains. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, I guess it's very complementary to Lightning um, in that uh, it's more suited, I guess, for larger um, transfers. I mean, so it doesn't suffer from the liquidity issues that Lightning does, but it does have other um, UX issues, uh, spe- specifically due to the fact that you can only transfer, you know, whole UTXOs, so you have this issue of, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, kind of only being able to, you know, deal with, with coins, essentially. Um, uh, but yeah. Look, it starts to look like an open, like a virtual open dime in a way. That's the way we try and explain it to people that are not familiar with these kind of layer two protocols. And, and I mean, that kind of resonates with a lot of people. That is actually a really way, a really good way to put that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Yeah, but so obviously, then I guess people can then understand the the limitations, um, uh, which kind of uh, a bit, you know, uh, in in we'll you know we'll see how actually this this gets used. But you know, we're we're thinking about designing of the wallet now and how that. So when people deposit money onto this, you know, how it splits up the funds into you know, kind of some kind of binary de- decomposition of values, you know, that, that you should be able to send, you know, um, close to what you want to send quite easily. Um, but also having a, a system where you actually kind of have this um, standardized amounts uh, actually helps the privacy an awful lot and helps the ability to do coin swaps uh, an awful lot. You know, so if, if, if you have a, uh, everybody is basically using the same divisions um, and the same amounts in their UTXOs. Uh, you can, yeah, you can make it a lot easier to do to do kind of quantum swaps and things. Yeah, that's actually you know a really interesting composition I've been thinking about because you know it's it's like coin swap at least the the protocol that uh, Belker is proposing right now. Like that is a really amazing um, jump forward from just the original like swap. Like the the way I'm reasoning about that is effectively like routing bitcoins invisibly through a wormhole with, with no connection on chain. And something like Mercury could, you know, the, the way that he's he's considering routing coins through multiple hops, like and, and fragmenting them to obscure amount correlations like you can lift even some of that off chain now and just add a whole new layer of of pretty much clusterfuck in the head of people trying to analyze that yeah i think um that that's our that's our kind of our 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 aim really and uh, we, we you know we're hoping that this can be because every time you do a swap, I mean, the, the issue with, with kind of on-chain coin joins uh, um, uh, is that basically the time you have to wait, the on-chain expense, um, whereas if you can make this, you know, you can do hundreds of, of swap kind of operations uh, virtually instantly, um, then this can be quite appealing for people, yeah, that want to want these kind of... Want, want to use this kind of privacy. Uh, um, although we would, we've been talking about this and what, what it means for, for privacy. And I guess it applies to uh, coin swaps as well. Is that it's a different, um, yeah, it's a, it's a different kind of, uh, the way it works is very different from coin joins. Um, and that you're not, you're not kind of creating ambiguity about the history of your coin. Well, you, you are, uh, but you're kind of assuming that you're upsetting the heuristics, which say coin analysis uh, people use. Um, but in the early stages, if they're not aware of that, you, you've 
just you just swap the ownership of the coins so you haven't kind of created ambiguity as to uh their previous ownership um as you would if you'd done a coin join um but as far as say you know the coin analysis may look at a transaction and so you've actually swapped coins with someone now you know you've got i had the good coin you've got the dodgy coin and we swap and so now we um you have the dodgy coin i have the good coin um so long term obviously we hope that these kind of things and and coin swaps will kind of uh end up breaking the assumptions that chain analysis works on um <clears throat> and that you can no longer assume that a utxo you know um on the on-chain history of a utxo actually corresponds to its real ownership um, but in the meantime i don't know in the early stages of these kind of these these new ideas um what you know yeah whether people will want to use it as much as they currently use coin joins we're, we're not sure yeah that's definitely an important aspect to that it's you're you're more trading the any taint history with other people rather than obscuring it and I mean, that, that's kind of part of the reason I think, at least personally, like coin swap isn't going to completely replace coin join. I think it'll be more of a synergy between them. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I could, I could very easily see a, an ecosystem kind of habit develop where people run a coin through a coin join to obscure things. And then it is these coin joined outputs um, being coin swapped around. Yeah, yeah, we were thinking about we we were thinking about you know whether you could do some kind of coin join on the deposit step. Um, uh, yeah, and and just long term, obviously, I think that once if these things end up being successful and coin swap ends up being widely used, then then again you 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 break the assumptions of of all the the chain analysis uh, anyway. Um, but yeah, for for the initial kind of time being, I guess it's going to take people willing to take the plunge in uh, kind of swapping their 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 outputs um with with other people but yeah we'll see mm-hmm. i mean everybody's got to take a first step in something yeah um, you know another thing though since um since the initial dropping of the the mercury specification you guys have also um dropped on the mailing list a proposal um, for a blinded variant of this. Yeah. And, you know, am I correct in kind of, uh, you know, assessing that the throwing that out there is looking at these kind of privacy applications of Mercury and how um, leaking information to the state chain entity when they're facilitating transfers might negate some of the, the privacy benefits there? There's issues with that, and there's also the fact that a blinded server, you know, can't can't be held accountable for anything in this in this sense. So, but I mean, it's we you know we're very experimenting at this stage. Just certainly wouldn't be off you know release one. We just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, so I think with this with this um, blinding, uh, I think it's it's a really cool um, idea that you that you have this, yeah, that the station entity basically doesn't know and cannot know anything about the UTXOs that it's um, uh, co-signing for. Um, but the, as, as we've started to develop the um, uh, this, this blinded idea, we have come across some kind of problems that I think remain uh, unsolved. Um, so I think we can do the, the actual blind signing we can do. Uh, um in this, with this two-party CDSA, that seems quite straightforward. Um, but then there is other kind of issues that we've we've come across. One is um, if you have a fully blinded state chain entity, is how you do proof of publication when you have UTXOs that are blinded um, for like being able to proof uh, or being able to pe- people being able to uh, verify that there you know there was no double spends of these UTXOs, um, which we we our current design. We're going to, yeah, basically publish to Bitcoin via this this mainstay protocol. Um, the ownership, uh, basically, of, of each UTXO, so that people can prove it's unique. Now, when you when this is blinded, 
uh, it becomes more difficult to do that when you have this kind of the station entity is essentially doing doing the publication. Um, also, there's other privacy issues we came up with. One of the things we wanted to do have the, the state chain entity um, uh, basically keep because I mean we 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 understand that most pe- most users are going to be uh, kind of have lightweight wallets um, for this. Um, obviously, kind of sophisticated users, power users will um, have their own. Um, have their own nodes and things, um, but the in terms of you, you, the require for this for this backup transaction system, you, you require to watch the chain exactly as you do in in Lightning. Um, <clears throat> and so, obviously, if we were going to operate the, this kind of watching service um, to make sure that none of our you know people that are using the state chain entity would ever get defrauded um there's a privacy issue there because obviously then we, we have to be aware of the the utxos um to hold the backup transactions um so so yeah i think the, the, the blinded thing is 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 really cool and i think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pursue it um one of the um yeah the, the, the main thing we want to do is we want to make sure that no one can ever know <clears throat> who was swapped with who not including the state chain entity um so the state chain entity is going to be able to enforce like if you do a swap it's going to be able to enforce like atomicity so you two two people can basically request that two utxos are swapped um so essentially this means just transferring the ownership um basically in, in an atomic way so that you've got yeah two two utxos and we want to transfer it to these two new addresses and we want to request the state chain entity does this uh, atomically um but the problem is then the state chain entity kind of learns um you know who was swapped with who or which at least they can kind of reconstruct the transaction graph um so this is what we wanted to avoid and the main motivation of having a, a blinded state chain entity um but there are other things we, we can do that can um can prevent the state chain entity from learning uh, information about how the ownership has changed like for example essentially having kind of coin join type uh requests you know that you would actually get a request to the state chain entity to say you've got you know it would just have like you know 10 utxos that we want to transfer 10 like one bitcoin utxos and we want to transfer these 10 one bitcoin utxos to these 10 new addresses and the state chain entity would receive this request signed by each of the owners of the 10 new TXOs um, and we've processed this request atomically, but then the community has no idea about that could be 10 owners. Um, it, it, they, the state entity can, then, then cannot link the, basically the inputs and the outputs in the same way that you, you have with a, a coin join. Um, so even in the unblinded case, you can design a kind of swapping uh, system where the state chain entity basically cannot re- reconstruct the, the, you know, the, the chain of ownership of the UTXOs. So yeah, that'd be, that'd be really interesting because it's, you know, this, it's really subtle trade-offs from the non-blinded um, scheme. And it's, you know, this is something I've been kind of mulling over in my head since Ruben originally considered blinding, um, the, the original variant he designed and initially in my head like part of the whole model was you're going to have a state chain entity functioning as a federation where all of them can cross check things like the sequence number to make sure that a sequence number is reused to hang on to backup transactions to respond to old states being pushed to to just have like a clear view of things to keep that in check yeah and you when you blind it you completely move all of that security to the user and there's nothing that the state chain entity can do to kind of have your back or or help facilitate that that security model yeah, exactly. I think this is the, it creates kind of quite a lot more and yeah, quite creates more work on the code and the part of the, the users and the owners and the information they need to store and transfer. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's, 
considering the the benefits here, I think that's something that a lot of users might be totally okay with. And yeah, I mean, yeah. honestly, if when these things start deploying, I mean, I fully expect to see blinded and unblinded variants. I mean, the I think these types of second layer protocols are going to get really diverse. Like they won't just be a homogenous. Everybody's implementing this. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, we definitely see the 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 kind of the use in in, in both. Um, and yeah, and I, I really think that the, the blinded uh, signing thing is is it's cool. It's a cool concept that you just have this state entity basically enforce it. You know, it 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 you people can trust it um, to enforce certain rules, but it really doesn't know anything about what it's signing. You know, I think it's a and it, yeah, it's a really kind of cool idea that you you have this thing and it just has no idea you know how much money it's transferring which which makes it a lot more difficult for it to kind of collude with anyone Mm -hmm. i mean it's you know it's it's really this this type of improvement to trust models like this that really interests me in this space like what something i've been shrieking about for years is so many people in this space are just throwing all their time into the perfect decentralized solution or layer or self-sovereign way to deal with something. And it's what about the people who aren't going to be able to handle that? Like what, what about the people who are going to shuttle into something like Coinbase? Um, Where is the attempt to improve that trust model to help those users? And it's exactly this type of thing that's going to create those middle grounds that maybe they can move into from Coinbase and handle that. You know, like it's, you're taking a trusted entity and minimizing what you have to trust it about to the absolute bare minimum necessary to facilitate that service. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that we uh, also, you know, I've always thought from a kind of just as a, a business perspective, you know, trustlessness, complete trustlessness, like lightning, um, is it's kind of it's actually difficult to to kind of uh, have a, a, a create a, a I guess a, a a business around this because because it's trustless. There's there's no need for reputation. There's no need for any kind of trust. Um, whereas this this state change idea, I think it, it fits a nice gap where you have can trust minimize trust minimized uh, given that you're uh you're doing this the, the nature of the the off-chain transfer um but the fact that it's non-custodial which makes it a lot easier from a regulatory kind of point of view um but you also have a uh you know you have an opportunity for businesses to you know to, to have a reputation uh and to provide a service um which you do need to trust them for um, the thing is that you, you can't just be completely anonymous as a state chain entity because you, you are required, you're required to trust that they don't attempt to defraud you. Um, so, so yeah, I think it feels this, I think it feels quite a nice gap. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, uh, be remiss if I didn't get a little bit into lightning liquidity dynamics, but you know, I think, is state chains, whatever trade-off or or variant there is that can be deployed on the main chain, like that is going to be like, it's, I I don't see things like state chains as their own independent second layers. I see them as just a different type of payment channel that is eventually going to get folded into lightning because that's what it does. It routes payments through payment channels. And I think that the thing state chains bring to the table is removing that capital inefficiency. You know, like a a lot of the, the use cases for lightning really require either probabilistically very inefficient capital deployments or they require reputation to kind of creep into the system in a way um, that emulates credit and credit mm-hmm. scores. And this is a massive way for uh, liquidity to be 
kind of managed more efficiently between routing participants and non end users in the system that I think is going to be a massive driver um, for, you know, maybe not having to rely on that type of credit score dynamic uh, to be able to use lightning in, in a way to receive. Yeah. 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 It, 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 discrete log contract stuff first, which I think was on Taj's original paper was for lightning anyway. Or I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. T -t uh, he, he is a, a really smart dude. <laughs> I think his original paper for discrete log contracts was on lightning. But I remember. It was a, it was a... Yeah, um, and I think also, um, you know, aside from what Tage's original work was, um, Nadav Cohen from uh, Sherdbits has been doing um, some really awesome stuff, and uh, the the Crypto Garage folks too. Yeah, we've spoken to Nadav. We had a call with him some time back, about some ideas. Yeah, we're working on a, a. He was also working on a kind of novation um, system that was was more uh, trustless. Um, so, but they, 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 yeah, that their their idea required like cooperation um, to innovate, you know, change ownership of the the DLC. Um, but yeah, they're doing really cool stuff. Um, yeah, we spoke to him a few weeks ago. I always mm -hmm. like to hear that the smart people I talk to are always talking to each other. It means good things are going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we've we've had some people that we've we've obviously spoken to Ruben originally, and you know, he was quite supportive. Um, Bob McElrath, you, you may know, I think you know, he he's been kind of involved a lot as well. He's been advising us a lot on the cryptography and some of the business models for this as well. So it's been we've been trying to be open as as much as possible, and we have spoken to Digital Garage as well on, on discrete log contracts, and they were quite interested in the state chain idea of novating things. So it's it tried to make it as open as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you guys got any other uh surprising or, or novel ideas that you could try and throw this at i think we just want to get it live i mean i think things will come out once it's operational you you just don't know how people are going to use it so that's our our, our our journey is really to get this on, on tin as, as quickly as possible, have a UI as quickly as possible, and then see how people want to use it. As like I said, we were thinking, we weren't thinking of a retail product originally, but then I think some of the excitement that happened after we uh, Tom published on the, the dev mailing list suggested that there was a market for that. Okay. Yeah, I think there's there's different. Um, I say the, the 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 kind of the the settlement aspect is is promising um but i think if we want to have a, a big impact we, we yeah we are we are we are kind of thinking of initially targeting it as a, a kind of privacy um tool um uh, which i think will get people using it um because i think that's, that's the problem if you, you come up with this new thing you launch it and go right okay who wants to to, to use this you, you you have to i think create some momentum and some some excitement to actually get people people start using it uh, the privacy use case i think could, could drive quite a lot of uh, interest and uh, um you know volume to it um mm -hmm. so um well i i don't really know um how far you guys are down uh, this road in terms of thinking. Like, actually, I'm just realizing now I have never brought it up with you guys before. But, um, you know, g given that this is obviously an interactive um, protocol, uh, you know, what, what are your guys' thoughts in terms of the actual peer-to-peer -peer interactions and protocol for facilitating this? You know, um, I'm, I'm assuming that, you're not going to be able to really try to build into the uh, bolt spec because of the ECDSA MPC. Um, but, you know, are you, are you guys thinking at all um, in terms of like long-term compatibility or interplay on that front? It hasn't well, been on our radar, but I mean, it's not something we're opposed, but at, at this moment in time, I, we haven't really thought about that. But yeah, no, I, I can't see any reasons why it, there shouldn't there should be any compatibility issues. So any any, you know, the, the, this the the underlying kind of um, UTXO, uh, the underlying so it's not necessarily transferring ownership of UTXOs. The same the, the DLC uh, model, you 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 essentially you're transferring ownership mm -hmm. of a 
a, a single public key in a multi-sig. Um, and so, <clears throat> so yeah, there's, there's no reason uh, this can't be used for any kind of uh, movement of any ownership transfer of any part of, so it could be, you know, could be one uh, side of a lightning channel, one side of a DLC. Um, and, and yeah, so, so this, 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 yeah, this is something that we, we're very interested in and, and kind of, uh, I think could, could help, yeah, solve a lot of the, the issues, say with, yeah, liquidity and channels and things. Oh man. I'm starting to fucking feel the time difference right now, guys. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, like with you. Well, uh, I don't know. You, I'm kind of plumbed out as far as uh, digging into Mercury stuff. But uh, you guys have any general thoughts about anything going on in the ecosystem at the moment? I don't know, Nick. <laughs> you know I mean? uh, no, just just live day by day. I mean, I'm I'm open to the fact that Bitcoin may never change. So I'm kind of more leaning that way, especially if we hit another bull run. I try to avoid price predictions because so, so really, but yeah, I'm, I'm open. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I think we're, we're focused on, on building on the protocol as is, and that's really what, what are, what we're seeing. So. so, yeah, no, I think it's kind of, well, it's interesting times in the, one way to put it, it's interesting times in the world at the moment, but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic about Bitcoin, I guess, in the medium term. I think, um, but yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of this is, you know, a lot of the decisions we've made to, to pursue this is based on the fact that we, we think, uh, you know, Bitcoin is going to become more valuable. And also, um, you know, this, this kind of, these kind of second layer technologies, uh, um, work best when bitcoin is, is under a lot of demand you know um when when these are higher um so yeah this is what we're we're planning for we're planning for for kind of you know over the next year or two you know bitcoin hopefully entering another bull run and and uh you know becoming becoming uh bigger um so yeah, yeah but, a lot of our focus is making it's going to be on the user experience maybe yeah, you know, we've built supply chain infrastructure in the past, but maybe that hasn't been as as, as warming. And yeah, you know, if we have we look at other protocols, they have created nice UI experiences, and I think that's a lot of our thoughts around the design of this is going to be centered around that. I mean, that's why when we were looking at blinded signatures, because of all the the metadata that would potentially have to be stored on the client, we thought that that could be prohibitive to people using this. So I think Bitcoin's mature enough now that we you know we've got to be targeting users that aren't necessarily going to be happy on a command line and in a sense want a nice simple to use ui yeah that is definitely uh where a lot more people need to be thinking in terms of this or 90 percent of the people who come in on this uh next bull market are just never going to leave coinbase or cash app yeah <laughs> so we, we won't be building an electron type ui but yeah although we want to make it so that it's it's kind of flexible um we want you know that people should have the the ability to use it uh, in a more sophisticated way if they want to um mm -hmm. yeah. i mean it's interesting times ahead and you know there's mm -hmm. nothing can ever go wrong by building uh assuming no future changes except making more work for yourself to incorporate those future changes <laughs> yeah <laughs> Although, you know, if, if, if Schnorr does get activated, I mean, obviously, if, I think the, um, if, in fact, if Schnorr got activated fairly soon, I would may, maybe not even update the, uh, it, depending on how well the, the two party CDSA is working. Um, the real big improvement we would get is, uh, like, uh, SIG hash no input, um, which would basically give us kind of infinite, uh, ish, you know, um, kind of uh, ownership transfers for for a given UTXO. So um, that would be a big one. And yeah, if 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 and when that happens, that'd be great. But if it doesn't, you know, we, yeah, <laughs> we say you just have to 
just have to make it work. I mean, I've been thinking lately, honestly, if something did happen with Schnorr um, and that didn't actually go through, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that literally every change uh, in the future is not going to happen, just maybe not substantial cryptographic ones. I mean, sig hash, no input, it's just a sig hash flag. There, there's no reason that can't work with ECDSA. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So in that, potentially that could be a lot less uh, controversial, I guess. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you that you, that you, that you think Schnorr might be a little bit contentious. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, well, I mean, I'm just trying to think it's like we are in a whole different world in this market. You know, I, I, I don't think that businesses in this space now like the the user base hodlers market participants for the most part would find schnorr contentious but at the rate things are going what happens when in a year or two and that's getting ready to be deployed i mean banks in germany can custody bitcoin now what happens if jp morgan starts doing that like the the entire landscape shifts that's a whole different, you know, set of ecosystem participants that now all have a, a say in the market as to whether that goes through or not. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And it becomes as, <laughs> as it becomes, as the, the network effect grows, then it, yeah, it just becomes more difficult for anybody to agree on anything, which and is also, a good the thing. Only here is like IPv4. I mean, I remember IPv6 being looked at 20 years ago and they still haven't really rolled that out fully. So there is a president of these protocols ossifying and being almost impossible to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're just adding a million more incentives to be hyper cautious about that because this is money, not just moving arbitrary packets. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And as the value grows, yeah, it becomes the people become a lot more risk averse. Um, so yeah, you can definitely see this trajectory of uh, it becoming yeah just fixed, um, which has a, a lot of power, um, <clears throat> you know. But yeah, it's maybe less interesting for people wanting to uh, explore kind of uh, um, technological advances. The only consequence, it, I mean, you, you could argue it, it will make layer two solutions harder to build. And does that mean more people just transact on coin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then it make yeah make layer two solutions harder to build. It makes them more valuable as well. But does it create a world where people are just sending their Bitcoin to somebody on Cash App as opposed to Lightning or something else? Well, I well, mean, yeah. I my thinking on it honestly is if that were to happen, then payment channels just become much more valuable. And um, more like a savings account than mm -hmm. a transactional layer. And I'll, I'll just move 100 sats to Cash App when I want to go buy coffee. But the rest is staying in that channel that I can close out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, Bitcoin is a beast of its own. And I feel like too many people you just have this guarantee in their head that it can be tamed in whatever way they want it to be. And I, I don't think that's going to be true forever. Yeah. Well, the track record of people trying to do that is not very good. So that's one thing that's warming. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, I, I think I'm really uh, out of stuff to dive through unless you guys got uh, anything else you wanted to get into or any final thoughts? No, thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, I think it's the second time, so appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. It's kind of uh, I'm always like, yeah, I'm always uh, really, <laughs> you know, surprised at how well you you actually kind of read everything <laughs> and understand everything, which is kind yeah, of uh, the only show I watch these days. So there's so yeah, much content. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, Google. Uh, YouTube search doesn't want me to find you. You're never popped up as a recommendation, so I have to look for you. <laughs> Censorship. Censorship. 
It's all your language, and you need to tone it down to keep the YouTube happy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's it's always a blast having you guys on, and uh, I'm sure. I'm sure something uh, very soon will come spilling out of Commerce Block, and I want to drag you guys back on again. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> cool. Cheers, man. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the show, and uh, catch you later, punks. Cool. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> Let's hang it just on